When you first start gardening, you are stoked to get anything to harvest. A little sprig of basil is a huge success. But as the years go on, take a look at my annual vegetable patch, I'm gonna have to replace all of this next season, clear it all out, and it's a lot of work, and it's part of the fun, but sometimes you want things to be a little bit easier. So in this video, myself, Jacques, Bethany, and a special guest are gonna give you some perennial vegetables that you can plant once and harvest for years. Let's kick it off with an absolute tank of a perennial here in my backyard garden. It looks like a lot right now, but honestly, when it's time to harvest, it won't look like anything. I'm talking about asparagus. This is a plant that can easily grow for 15 to 20, maybe even 30 years. And it's not really one plant that you're dealing with. You wanna plant out a bunch of them in a patch and let that patch mature over the years. So the beauty of asparagus is that it can be planted all the way from zone two up to the tropics. So it's a true all climate perennial, which is just an amazing, amazing gift. But what you see here is the mature stage when they're actually growing out. These are called asparagus ferns and beneath a couple years ago, I planted what are called asparagus crowns, or even you can do it from seed or seedling. Three different ways you can plant asparagus. But the beauty is patience. It takes a couple years for asparagus to establish itself. Those crowns are gonna start developing energy and they'll throw up a couple asparagus spears even in that first year. But if you harvest those, you'll be taking the powerhouse of the asparagus off too early in the season or too early in its life cycle. So what you wanna do is the first couple years, Maybe take one spear if you just absolutely can't wait, but leave all those spears to develop these ferns, which are sucking up a ton of energy from the sun, water, nutrients, and fertilizer, and developing that underground structure so that on year three and beyond, all the way till maybe year 30, you can harvest an abundant amount of spears. This is one of those plants that once it's established, you will never want for asparagus again in your life but you do have to get it established. And what you see here is a simple frame that we built. This is an eight foot by four foot birdies raised bed from us on our store. And this kit that I just put some jute around to keep these ferns in place. Cause as they get really tall, they will start to flop and fall over. It's not a big deal, but if you want a little bit less mess, then just tie something around them. This perennial plant is right before me and it is one that most people say, I can't even grow where I live. And that is not true. You could see it for yourself right here. And this is of course, rhubarb, also known as the pie plant. I hesitate to even call this a vegetable because the only way I've ever ate it is as a dessert, usually in pie, hence the name pie plant strawberry rhubarb pie or just straight rhubarb pie. All of those are super delicious. Now the cool thing about rhubarb as a perennial is that it usually grows in very cold zones. That's why I said I usually am told I can't grow it here. And that is why I chose a specific variety called Victoria. It is a type of rhubarb that can handle the heat, does well in a more wide variety of climates. It is greener than some of the standard classic rhubarbs that are usually that really cool deep red color, but the taste is still really quite delicious. Now, a couple tips for growing rhubarb. You can expect this to live for basically 10 years. It does not like the heat as I alluded to, hence why I'm in such a tight area of my garden, because I planted it behind my fruit trees and my Mexican sunflower here, so they would get shaded from the intense summer heat. Now, I will mention though, even though I did shade it as best I could, I did have some of these leaves die over the weekend because it literally got to 103 degrees here and the plant is still living. Now, speaking of harvesting, how do you harvest this plant? The best way to do it is actually not with like a pruner or a knife, but instead you just wanna go ahead, come down to the base of the plant, grab it really near it, and then pull it to the side. If you pull it to the side, you'll get that entire stalk releasing without damaging the plant. The next thing I like to do is just get a knife out and I'll trim off this top leaf. The top leaf itself actually has a ton of oxalic acid, which is really hard on your digestion to the point where most people would consider it toxic. This is the part of the plant you actually want to eat. This is the rhubarb stalk. What I like to do is cut it up into little chunks, put it in a freezer bag, keep it in the freezer until I have enough to make a pie, and that's all there is to it. It will just grow on its own. It'll come back every single year. After like four years, you're gonna to want to cut it up and divide it so it doesn't get too crowded, but a very tasty perennial that makes wonderful pies. My favorite perennial plants in my garden are my fruit trees. Now, when I first started container gardening, I thought I was gonna be much more limited in what I can grow than I actually turned out to be. So as long as I get the right types of plants, I can have my own mini orchard on my rooftop deck garden. So I have four different fruit trees so far. I'll probably add more soon. And as long as I get varieties that are either compact or grow more vertically than they do wide, 
they fit perfectly in my garden. So I have here a miniature peach tree. This one is year one in my garden. I haven't had it fruit yet. Then I have two columnar apple trees. So these are fantastic because they are gonna stay so narrow and just keep getting taller. If you want to grow apple trees, you do need two different varieties so they can cross pollinate. I actually got these two together in a kit. It's the second year for these in my garden and I got three apples this year, which is very exciting. The first time I've grown my own apples. And then lastly, I have a Chicago party fig. This is also the first year in my garden for it, but I've had at least two figs off of it already and there's another one growing on it right now. So far, these have been pretty low maintenance for me, which is very nice. Now they are on the smaller side still. So I'm keeping them in smaller containers and then just upsizing them slightly each season as they continue to grow. But right now, they're still really easy for me to move around in these smaller pots. At some point, I'll probably end up growing these in like 20 inch diameter pots once they hit their full size and it might be a little bit harder to maneuver them around the deck, but these have just been so much fun to grow. All of these fruit trees do want full sun at least six to eight hours a day. And because they're in full sun and in relatively small pots, I do have to water them around once a day when we are in the hottest part of the garden season. Since I'm watering so often, and they are in pots. I also do fertilize more than I would if they were growing in the ground. So I just use a general all-purpose fertilizer about once every six weeks on all of these, and that's worked really great. Now for overwintering, very, very important. So I'm currently in a zone 6A, but if you're growing in containers and you want to leave plants out over the winter, make sure you go at least two zones colder than your current zone. So I would want to make sure that these plants are at least a zone 4A or else I need to store them somewhere that's a little bit more protected to keep them alive during the winter, especially when they are smaller. So if you are growing on a deck or all in containers, know that you can also create your own mini orchard. I am now standing amongst one of my favorite perennial plants that Kevin trash talks all the time. I don't know what his deal is against it. You guys should ask him because he's been very mean about it. And that is my tree collard, AKA tree kale, AKA walking stick kale, it has many names. This is a perennial leafy green that produces kale or collard like leaves, depending on what you feel like calling them. And it is actually quite tasty. Now here's the thing, in the summertime, not that great, but neither is any of my other kale. They tend to be more bitter and tough, but come winter, come spring, when it's nice and cool, this makes sweet, nutty, big, giant kale leaves that are wonderful in soups. They're wonderful even raw. They're not as stringy as most kales. I don't know why people don't grow more of it. Honestly, it's probably because it's really hard to find. This thing can live for up to 10 years, but the deal is I've had this in the garden now for about four years. It's only produced seed a single time. Most people only get it through plant propagation, through cuttings, and that is honestly the way I would go about it. If I were to propagate this, I could do it either through a couple different ways. I could wait and try to get lucky to see if it produces seeds, but my personal preference is to take a knife and cut it only where it's the most tender, where it wants to break very easily. Remove every single one of these leaves, and then you put this in a nice wet pot of soil, and it should be able to develop roots. I've actually done that a couple times and transplanted them around my garden, but in the end, I still only come back to this one because this one plant is producing at least 20 different side shoots and all of them are producing tons of kale. So if you want something that's long lived, produces really delicious greens, I would highly encourage you keep your eye out for tree collards or tree kales, whatever the name is in your area, because it is quite tasty and it is entirely carefree. My next one is almost a prehistoric vibe and it's quickly become one of my favorite vegetables, whether they be annual, or perennial, it's in this patch right now, you probably can't see it, and I'm talking about my artichoke. Artichoke is a perennial, and the way it propagates itself is by dividing itself, by shooting offshoots off of the main artichoke that you plant. You can plant this from a transplant, but if it's fall in your climate as you're watching this, you can also plant it from seed or seedling, and it will grow out really well in the early fall, establish itself, kind of set up structure through the winter, and then you'll get that first harvest of artichokes the following spring. But take a look right here. I've got a young, small artichoke, but in fact, this patch is many years old, about four years old now. And you can tell because I have these old stems that I've severed off once the artichoke from last season was done. So if you're in a warm climate like I am, you'll probably get two rounds of artichoke per season, once in spring and once in fall. I'm getting my fall crop 
right now. But this is to me the amazing part about an artichoke patch. I got one, two, three, four, five, six of them, but they're not taking up a whole lot of space now. In spring, they'll be absolutely insane. They'll be crazy, but while I'm waiting for that, what am I gonna do? I've got some annual flowers in here, some little landscaping plants. I've got some native milkweed and some salvias that I can landscape this area while the artichoke is dormant and just establishing itself. Because come spring, it will be completely covered in artichoke. I won't have any ability to plant any flowers. So this is a very creative planting technique you can use for perennials that do have a dormant period, but you still have a climate that can support some other life. So it's a kind of a dual use space for me, edible and ornamental. This next perennial is actually something that might surprise even the most experienced grower. And it's something that I discovered early on by total chance. And that is the fact that this Scarlet Runner bean here is a perennial. That's right, beans can be perennial. Scarlet Runner beans are the only one I really know of, but apparently some other runner beans also have this ability. A couple reasons why this bean is perennial is the fact that it could grow in really high altitudes in cold climates. So this comes down from South America where they were able to grow up in the mountains where most beans traditionally don't do that well. So what is their strategy to surviving? Well, their strategy is that underground, they'll actually produce a tuber. It looks kind of like almost a dahlia or like a weird multi-forked white carrot, but it will actually literally produce a tuber underground and what happens is in the winter time, when the cold comes in, eventually it will die to some level of frost. The plant will entirely wilt back down to the ground, but the tuber will still remain. And that tuber could re-sprout year after year once the soil warms up around springtime. But the thing is, most people don't get to that point because it often will rot underground. This has happened to me most of the time, but in my first year of growing scarlet runner beans, I read that fact that it had the edible tuber. I dug it up, toasted it up in the oven, fried it all nice with olive oil, and honestly, I wouldn't recommend it. It doesn't taste like much of anything. It kind of tastes like a dirty potato. It is edible and it is calorically valuable, but it's not gonna be the best tasting thing. So here's the problem. Underground, they can rot due to rain. So if you live somewhere very wet, you're probably not gonna get them to be perennial year after year, and you're just going to have to grow them as annuals. Even here in San Diego, where we don't get that much rain, they still rot for me most of the time, but it is technically a perennial and it has lived for many years for many other people. Look who's back. Eric here. By the way, I've been on perennials for years, way before Kev. He took his inspiration from me, but I have probably the most fire pick for today's video. It is the Jerusalem artichoke, also known as the sunchoke, also known as the fartichoke. The craziest part about this plant that Kevin has no clue about is that it has nothing to do with Jerusalem and nothing to do with the artichoke family of plants. It's actually related to a sunflower and it's native to here, North America, to the point where it will actually produce tiny little yellow flowers. But the juice, what we really want to be eating for that perennial vegetable is down below. And what I mean by that is we're eating the tuber of the Jerusalem artichoke, which I'm going to call artichokes from here on out because I gave Kev a serving once and let's just say I never, I never smelled the end of it. <laughs> anyway, so what we're doing here, we're planting these in a raised bed. Why? Because they're not so much a perennial as they are a self-spreading semi-annual plant, which means if you plant the farted choke in ground in loose soil, you will never see the end of it. So I like planting them in a raised bed. Maybe a round raised bed like this is a really good choice. The other thing I wanna say is how do you eat them so they actually taste good? The best thing I've ever seen is Jacques on the team, my boy, Jacques. He likes to slice them thin and fry them up like potato chips or roast them whole. That is the way to eat the sunchoke. We grew these a few times last year. It was absolutely amazing. I don't know what Eric was talking about, but I have something actually important to share with you from our friends at Planet Wild. As gardeners, we grow to eat and enjoy our food with friends and family, but also to improve the environment in just a small suburban backyard in my case. That's where Planet Wild comes in. They're a member supported organization that partners with environmental orgs around the world to rewild the environment in some really epic projects. For example, over on their YouTube channel, you can see them bringing Europe's cutest bird back to the habitat or even rewilding the American Midwest. But the coolest part is you're a member and you have proof that they happened by checking out the episode on the YouTube channel. So I'm personally subscribed at their legend tier of membership. And so far I've supported four different Planet Wild projects. Most recently, 
bringing back bison and pronghorns to the American Midwest. And because it's a membership, you can sign up at whatever tier makes sense for you and your budget. You can cancel any time. And because we think it's so important, we are going to give the first 200 people to sign up using the QR code right here or the link in the description a free month to Planet Wild. So you can join me in supporting some of these awesome missions that they do. And speaking of, you can check out those two missions that I mentioned right here on Planet Wild's YouTube channel. Good luck in the garden and keep on growing.